Hello. Oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Let's try that again. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. Welcome to this Slim DevOps episode 30. It was almost 31 there because I stopped the stream briefly. <laughs> I, I, I hope that didn't go through. Um, if you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, uh, come and see how we do professional live streaming on twitch.tv <laughs> slash Slim DevOps. Uh, I'm Martin and uh, here's my, my colleague, Peter. Hello, Pete. How you doing? Oh, I am I am great. There are just gremlins out there today. I mean, we have had a nonstop cavalcade of uh, you know comedy of errors here. But uh, thanks everybody for joining. Good to be here. So yeah, uh, desperately seeking some expertise this evening. I think so or today. <laughs> so um, welcome back. Um, so Pete, what's what's new with you? Uh, well, I am getting ready to go skiing, so that's oh, that's very new nice, to me, and that's pretty exciting. Um, so yeah, right after we get off of this, you know, I'll have some ski photos to share with everybody. But uh, you know, that's uh, good. I got my ski sweater on. I got my uh, car is packed with my skis, and we're ready to go. We're going up to Vermont. It's snowing up there, I think. So yeah, what's what's going on with you? Uh, well, it's uh, it's evening here. Uh, after the stream, uh, I will be practicing some uh, online racing. There's an uh, online racing uh, tournament at the weekend, and I'm terrible, so I'm going to practice and see if I can get good in like 45 minutes. <laughs> that sounds that sounds good. I mean, you got to train. You know, training super important, yeah. especially for online racing and. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't skied in like two years, so uh, you know, if I uh, show up on the next Slim DevOps Twitch stream with a cast on or something, then everybody will know what happened. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So welcome back. Uh, hello, Big Pod. Big Pod is in chat. One of our colleagues. I'm sorry about the double notifications. I did genuinely press the stop button. I might have to rearrange my buttons on my stream deck because that's remarkably easy to do. It turns out. Um, and also welcome back Takov and hello to uh, Idiri. Welcome, welcome to for the first time. Thank you for joining. So um, mm -hmm. Pete, what are we doing this evening? It's a continuation of a, of a little project we're working towards, right? It is a continuation of a project that we've been working on actually for quite a bit now. So people who have been in the stream for a little bit um, have worked with us. We started with a pretty basic Python app and then we turned that into a more complex photo app, you know, with a photo carousel and stuff like that. And we've been, of course, putting these in containers because we're Slim AI and, you know, we're, we're really focused on the container space. And what we've kind of built towards over the past couple sessions has been basically splitting this app, like using a Docker Compose file so that we can have multiple services. And now we're splitting this app into sort of a front end and a back end. We're going to add a database and probably a reverse proxy. So it'll really start looking like a real app. Now it's the functionality and it's still pretty basic and, um, you know, all of that. But so last week we built a front end in Vue and Nuxt using the Beautify framework. And that was really fun to kind of play front end developer. Um, Martin, the, the time before that, you had kind of made a Docker compose file for this Python Flask component, which is now going to serve as our back end. And what we're doing today and what we've been uh, doing all day today <laughs> is, <laughs> is getting this back end to talk to this front end and making it um, uh, uh, look look and feel like a real app and, and operate like a real app. So we'll be sharing a lot of that today and we'll be kind of building the Docker Compose file together. So uh, you posted the link to the GitHub repo so people can go get the code. You'll now see there's a folder for the back end, a folder for the front end. And we've made a few updates to the examples that we did yeah. previously right so there's some new stuff in there and so for the uh the purposes of things going forward um i am, am assuming the role of the uh back-end engineer and yes, you and I, are our front-end engineer right i know i kind of feel like maybe we should have dressed up you know like i should have gotten <laughs> some like you know designy type stuff you know like yeah, nice. And and, <laughs> yeah, 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 you get the, the neck beard and that, and you can just argue over, you know, yeah. who's the better framework. But <laughs> so we did, we did uh, a couple of streams ago draw a very simple network diagram, and I suppose we're working mm -hmm. towards the separation of that. So shall mm -hmm. I talk about the backend app and the changes that we've made um, so far to that today? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Let's start there. So um, uh, my code editor is here. So um, our back end is written in Python uh, using the Flask framework. And until today, this Python app was a monolithic app. It was the front end, it was the back end, and it was also the thing that spoke to the database server. So uh, these are all of our imports in order to give us the tools that we need. We've got a couple of defines to uh, explain what images we're going to allow and where we're going to store them. We are still creating the database here and I think that in the next stream in this series, what we're going to do is then move the database component out into its own container. So this is sort of the remaining vestiges of, of that sort of monolithic app that sits in the back end at the moment, but we'll be removing that. We have a simple function to determine whether a file that's been uploaded is um, an allowed file type. And then we have some basic roots. Um, roots. So we're using decorators that are part of Flask to define um, the roots and so this was the application previously this was the front end and there was a template associ associated with this and the carousel was there that's all gone away we've just replaced that with a simple status to say yes uh, the back end is functioning and then we have a simple API we have one which is a get request to the images endpoint and that iterates over our upload folder, finds all of the images and sends that back as a JSON object. Um, and in fact, we could probably demonstrate what some of these responses look like. We then have another endpoint, which is the image path. And so the idea is, is that you can then from traversing this API, you can then fire requests at this based on what came back in order to actually have it send you the image. And then for uh, the futures, um, we've got an upload endpoint and this does work. And in here we've got a, a simple documented <coughs> end, um, test case for how, the, how you can upload an image to this server. Um, so that's the upload piece. And again, I've just commented out the what was here the vestiges of the database code because we'll replace this with probably a, an api call to a database server container uh the next time round uh, we go and then we just got some cleanup so that's a very simple app so no front end here thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> yep so you've kind of removed anything that is serving HTML, all that, and this is just mm -hmm. basically a, a JSON REST API. Is, yes. Is all we have here with a couple of roots and some upload capability and stuff like that. And then this will talk to the database when we build it next week. Yeah. Cool. So what's next? So, well, so I had to make some changes on my side, you know, uh, you, you Backend devs get all the the glory, but you know, as front end devs, you know, we have we have work to do too. We can write for loops oh. and, and that kind of stuff. Um, let's see. Can you share my? I think it's my IDE screen. So I that. was just go. looking at that, and that and this is one of those things where it's decided uh, not to function. So okay. How Let about? Let me see if I can do better. Yeah, why don't you bring up the? Do you want to bring up the README file, or if you bring up the I can, screen, I can do I can that. Do, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think I might just need to pull because I think you said there were some new changes. There we go. So if I just bring up the README, uh, is this all I need, or um, is there anything? Yeah, if you just kind of scroll down to where the front end code um, is highlighted in there, uh, it should be. Um, you know, it's pretty simple stuff here. So for the, any view developers that are joining us, you know, you'll, you'll know this pretty well or JavaScript developers. But if you remember last time we were working on this, on this carousel component. And so that's what we're updating here. So in the carousel component, you know, of course we have the template, then we have the script, then we have the styles. Um, all we have to really update for this is, um, some small parts of the script. Uh, there is a little bit uh, that we have to update in the view side, but 
we're using the Axios library, you know, it's just kind of a helper function for doing Ajax requests. I really hate doing Ajax requests, but uh, this makes it really, really simple. Um, and what we're doing, you know, so uh, Vue has you sort of do two main things, data and methods. So data is sort of where you define your model, you know, you define the types of type of data that you're going to see in the app and then methods tend to be more of the functions and when you're changing things and doing different bits. So if you remember the photo carousel from last time, you know, we had kind of hard coded in these items, which were the image paths. And we still have one example here just to remember how we were doing that. This is sort of a message of what that looked like. Um, and then, you know, we add this other little sort of helper function, which I'll, I'll explain a bit more in a second, but it's called done getting items. It's just basically a way for us to kind of tell Vue to wait until we fetched everything we need from the back end before we start to try to populate or, or um, you know, show the, yeah. uh, uh, build the photo carousel, right? So that's kind of the simple bit. The kind of more interesting bit is this get images function that we've now created. Uh, you, went, you went by it a little bit, Martin. Oh, so, sorry. Oh, higher up. Um, so this get images function that we have, um, what we do in here is we, we look for the back end um, through this route, through this uh, HTTP call. Um, and I do want to talk about that more in a minute because this was something that really threw us for a loop as we were mm -hmm. doing it. Um, I really thought we could do this a different way and we weren't able to. But this is calling port 5000, which is the backend app, right? And we we make an API call. We're logging some things just to, you know, because JavaScript. And um, we get this result. And when we get the result, all we're going to do is iterate through the images JSON object that Martin's backend has sent us. Um, we're going to use that to build items in this items uh, array JSON object that we have or, or JavaScript object that we have. Um, and then we're going to flip this uh, flag that we have done getting items from false to true. That's going to tell Vue to like, okay, now I can render this component and it's going to hydrate it with all the, all the goodness, which is all of the um, image paths, which are then going to go back and hit the back end to get those images back, right? So the very last thing is this created component. So Vue also has this little help, helper function that, you know, once sort of everything is initialized on the page, you can call anything that's in this created. So that's, you know, telling it, hey, run get images once the page is created. Uh, we have another check, um, you know, in the actual template HTML for that done getting items. So this sort of fires off that get images process. We wait until we get all of the images, then we render the component and we go from there. So those are the changes to the view app. That's all we had to do for the front end, um, you know. And now we just need to sort of like update the Docker compose file. Okay. Um, and we can actually go through this, Martin. Maybe if you try my IDE one more time, we can kind of go through this and see what this okay. looks like. Um, let me see if this. Oh, the internet is failing us, so. Uh, okay. That's fine. So we'll. Um, should we do this from scratch, or should we base it on what we on we on what we have here? Why don't we do it from? Uh, I'll tell you what. Do you have the Docker Compose file from your last episode from the Docker Compose? Uh, uh, well, I have enough of it in my head that I think I can <laughs> okay. recreate it. But I can I can actually cool. get it if you want. Yes, I could do. Um, let's have a look. If we do this, we were doing containers 101, Docker Compose, and yep. uh, is the Compose file in here? Should be. No, it's in oh, iPhoto right. app. There it is. That's the Compose file that we had previously. Mm -hmm. So we cool. want to take this Docker Compose that has a single monolithic app inside it and we want to have two com two services the front end and the back end so i mm -hmm. suppose the first thing we want to do is well given that this is the the python piece we probably want to change this to something like back end right mm -hmm. um and i guess that the what we've got here is if I if I say if I just move what we have here to one side, mm -hmm. so I'm going to in my, in the current working directory, I'm just going to move what we had to um, 
one side and then I will save this um, oops oh goodness what's going on here there we go save as so uh, we won't save it there we'll save it inside this folder we're working on and we'll save it over there so this is going to be our new docker compose so where we've got the build step here i think you know aspirationally in the future we're going to want something like um wimpress uh back end colon stable you know that would that would right. be like the image from docker hub for example that we would want to use but we're not doing that just yet because we've not pushed anything mm -hmm. there so we'll we'll comment that out hello eric thank you for joining us um mm -hmm. and the ports are the same because the thing still runs on port 5000 and certainly the volumes are the same because the back end is the thing that currently talks to the image store and still because we haven't separated it out talks to where the database uh file exists so that yep. is still um consistent um but i suppose and, and in fact i think that's it right i think that's all we need for um for the back end there are, yeah just two small changes if you go and you look at sort of your file structure you'll notice that the um now we have a different folder for our back end app and our front end app and this srv uh the serve uh folder is actually in a separate folder so um when you do your build right it's looking for the docker file in a specific folder right so you do want to put in back end forward slash dot so it'll look for yeah. the right Docker file. That's the backend Docker file to build that, right? So again, something that we will further separate in the future is I have the backend code in this directory and Pete has the front end code in this directory. So yes, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. That should be something like uh, backend, like so, mm -hmm. to tell it. Yep. And what we're referencing, what this dot is referencing here, just to be very clear what this is doing, this is actually referencing the backend Docker file. That's what that's doing. So that that build stanza is saying use this Docker file in order to create that container. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Oh, and Big Pod's making a point that you can actually keep the image tag in there because that will actually name the um, container uh, image when you build it. Um, so if you were then to like say push that to Docker Hub, you could actually keep that one. Um, yeah, so Big Pod can maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that if you actually, so then if you were to take the build out, right, it would just create the service from that image that it pulls from Docker Hub. Is that right? But if we leave build in there, then um, it'll build it then and it'll then label it, label it accordingly. Cool. Okay. Cool. Yep. So that looks good. The only other gotcha I had, and it might just be a Mac thing when I was doing this on my Mac, um, the compose file does require that the volumes are sort of uh, absolute paths. At least right. that, that was my um, understanding. So it seems like this one worked on yours last time. So probably. Yeah. Yeah. This maybe. was me just, you know, mounting up the place where I would serve our assets on a, on an actual cool. server. Yep. So. Cool. Uh, now we need to move on to uh, your front end, and I suppose some of this mm -hmm. is going to look a bit similar, right? We're going to tell it to build from front end um, dot, and that's because, as we were just discussing, we've got these things in in the same you know folder structure at the moment. So mm -hmm. uh, similarly, we can uh, give it an image name um let's let's do this reels what's your where would you push this to <laughs> slim psv would be my docker hub slim repo. psv uh slash front end latest so that would be where you would push things to um mm -hmm. and i seem to remember that your app was running on port 3000 right mm -hmm. so We'll do that. 
and you your app doesn't require any access to volumes i don't think because it is now going to be communicating to the back end which will be its broker to the other data sources yep okay yeah and we talked about this a little bit and i think it's something that we'll work on probably as part of next time when we start doing the database right which is like just where do you store these images right like i mean if this were all on a single VM, we would have a local host and these two things would be running independently. For right now, we're running them on, on your machine so we can store the images in that SRV folder and everything kind of works well. Um, when we do go to kind of push this to the cloud and we do the sort of final version of this, we'll need another image store place. It might be an S3 bucket, it might be something else, um, but we'll have to figure that out. But for right now, you're right. Like I don't have any reason to look for volumes because I'm calling the back end to get both mm -hmm. the data and the photo that I need. So, and and that leads us to the last thing in that that you now have we've got this front end and it needs to know it can talk to the back end and I believe mm -hmm. that we do that with uh, links mm -hmm. to say uh, is that correct to use that there? We want to say the links to and then the namespace back end like so mm -hmm. so this tells your front end app that it has connectivity to the back end container mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh so eric is pointing out in um in uh in chat here that um perhaps s3 uh for the image stores and indeed in the uh in the the version of the yaml that for the docker compose that we lashed up earlier pete did in fact put those very words mm -hmm. as comments in there to say you know this would probably be an s3 bucket in you know in the real world mm -hmm. yeah exactly right big pod saying he's not sure links are supposed to be used like that yeah we were this was the part that we were kind of struggling with right before we uh jumped on stream so if people have thoughts of or, or ideas for us um mm -hmm. if you remember my my carousel.view folder where you can see it in the readme we sort of reference uh i'm calling 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 port 5000 um as the api call i really thought i was going to be able to call just backend yeah. right you know like because that's in the docker network and i was able to get data out of it so there's a lot of weird behavior i think we we're gonna try to explore it a bit more in office hours tomorrow yeah but um yeah we couldn't quite get those aliases to work what, in this so i i've got the readme up now so this assumes that currently the um the front end and the back end are on the same host but what we had originally was something like this where instead of all the zeros we had back end and back end mm -hmm. here and we we had a di difficulty we could return data here from this api call but we couldn't seem to get the image paths out which we didn't understand and we were burning time it, we were we were being proper developers there for a moment because we were both universally time poor with an input <laughs> with a fast approaching hard deadline so yeah. and all of you on stream were our product managers saying where is that feature and we said you know what this works <laughs> so we did this in order to create a functioning application but we realize this is not the right solution so i'll just uh, i'll just take a little look here so um so uh, big pod says uh in fact let me just do this so big pod says that as far as they know the links are used to define aliases for names uh but you do need so this makes sense but you do need dns so okay uh i can send you what you need okay uh please do big pod you know if you're able to uh live patch our our example well not you know but you know communicate with us here and let us know what we need to do that would be advantageous mm -hmm. so uh and if not today then maybe big pod um you can join me tomorrow whilst we sort of you know debug this and figure it out so uh, if I just go back to the compose file, so this is what we have. Um, I'll just put that in there so my brain works and I can see there are two things in there. So should we try and build that and see what happens? Yeah, 
Let's do it. Um, okay. Uh, can I remember what we need to do? I think I can. It's Docker Compose. We need to um, up D. Is it a single thing or one? Is it like that? Yep, I think so. That's right to me. Have I spot that correctly? Looks like the, Let's uh, the maximize that terminal. So this is building two containers as opposed to a single container, which is where we were last time. Um, Eric saying tac tac build. I think that's what I put in there. Hopefully it's doing the mm -hmm. right thing. Oh, it's building. It's doing something. Yeah. <clears throat> few things node and python weren't super happy about but we can look into what those warnings and errors are maybe they're normal maybe they're not but added 1458 packages and therein lies why <laughs> docker slim was invented <laughs> right, 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 right. Right. so if there are new people joining um on stream just while this builds uh, one uh slim.ai if you go there you'll find a link to our discord down in the bottom of the page please join us there we do office hours we answer questions if you have ideas for us um you know we'd love to love to hear from you uh we're also a company that's behind an open source project called docker slim which minifies containers takes everything out of them that you that you don't need and so you can ship only what you do need to production and we'll be uh, kind of going through the minification process of this app once we get it uh, built and running and there's kind of some cool stuff that docker slim can do with docker compose files which is why we've been building towards this so yeah. So, uh, hello, Dammy Killer. Thank you for joining. Um, uh, and thank you for joining because I think I was chatting to you uh, yesterday evening. Um, yes, you point out, you know, 99 vulnerabilities, at least it's not 100. And in fact, you know, this is one of the one of the benefits of um, of Docker Slim in that when it does the minification process, when it analyzes, it traces all of the files that you actually need and jettisons everything that you don't, it significantly reduces your attack surface. So it's extremely useful as sort of a security tool. You don't have to change your build practices. You can use this as an additional step in the CI CD pipeline. And also, um, uh, uh, my, uh, let me just get this pronunciation right because I couldn't get it right last night. Uh, Malphabeth, uh, thanks very much for stopping by. Thank you for joining. I believe that we were chatting as well last night. So thanks for stopping by. So um, let's... Uh, uh, there's a couple of other questions. I'll get to those in just a moment. Um, let's... Um, uh, we've got some great questions, actually. So, uh, Eric and Malphabeth, we'll get back to those two questions that you pose uh, in just a moment. Our containers have built, so we've got a back-end and a front-end container. So, I'm going to bring up a browser, and we'll just do this, first of all. So if I go to localhost um, 5000, I should see that uh, I get the success message backend is ready. And if I go to Pete's application, uh, which is the front end, we should see, well, actually, I don't know what we should see because I don't do front end stuff. Oh my goodness, it's a, it's a website. <laughs> Look at that. What do I do now, front end developer? <laughs> <laughs> well, you would click on the carousel and the real magic moment is whether the images that we expected oh, I didn't. Uh, were able to be fetched from the back end. No, it's fine. Uh, I think you do. It's because there's no images. On... I don't think we've actually submitted any images, oh. right? So let's just drop back here. We can prove this to be true because um, I think we're starting with a fresh set. So if I go to serve photo images, oh, there are some there. Okay. Huh. Am I... So something Let's have a look at the Docker wrong. Compose file and make sure that that is the path that we linked to in the Docker Compose. So uh, it is. Hmm. And then app okay. static images. Curious. Surprised that did not work. Um, well, I tell you what we can do to make sure this is to make sure this is working. We can go back here and we can poke at our API because we uh -huh. can say to the API here images 
and it, do it does in fact return a bunch of images so I should now mm. be able to take one of these image strings let's just make sure that you know things are working on one half of the one half of the equation here we'll paste that in there and indeed that so the back end can see and serve images so what did we overlook oh sure blame oh. it on the front end code no no there's uh, a oh, bunch look, of stuff there, here. oh no it worked yeah of course it, no there's it's nothing working wrong with the front end code the front end code's great uh okay <laughs> i wonder well, why it loaded that oh i know oh, why i know why it i know why it is <laughs> that hard-coded example that you told me to take out <laughs> yeah you've got you've got a hard-coded yep. image path which doesn't exist on the server so right, there we go that's right. fine that's fine it's a, it is Perfect. actually working as intended <laughs> yes in yes. intended no permissions issue we had just hard-coded an example as a debugging tool actually because on my machine we were trying to get these images to show up and so i hard-coded this example to say okay you know as long as this image shows up then it's good but martin yeah. didn't have that image on his machine so as it linked into the volume of course um you know that image wasn't available so yeah there we go planned okay. error for the presentation of course yes exactly yeah. planned um <laughs> hard coding is such a joy i know it's the only way i get by in life <laughs> so, um, but we are now i think we are now officially not hard coded in this application other than that one little kind of debugging trick we were using so right. we really do have a front end that's talking to a back end and you know going forward we can rig up the uploader capability which already exists on the back end but needs to be wired into the front end um, and then wire up the database and then we'll, we'll really be in a pretty good shape with this thing as long as we have a uh, a place to store these images a place to store the data files for the database and um, yeah. it's all persistent and we'll be in good shape so um, there were a couple of I'm just going to switch to a different view whilst we we have this conversation yeah. here so um, there was um, uh, uh, a comment that Eric made that said, uh, so let me just let me just go and find this. Let's do it the right way. So Eric says uh, he enjoyed the blog post uh, from from me earlier. <clears throat> uh, we might know who that data scientist is. Yes, yes, Eric, it was <laughs> absolutely you. <laughs> that I was <laughs> I was citing in that. And um, the blog post in question, uh, let's just head over to a web browser again. Um, because this is actually a segue to uh, one of Malphabeth's questions. So if we go to Slim AI, the, uh, the blog post that Eric is referring to, sorry, I've got a lot of things open on screen at the moment is this one so what do docker slim users get out of slim sas platform and the key thing here is malphabeth asks what is the general idea behind minification and so that segues with this piece here about Docker Slim and the Slim IA, a Slim AI um, SaaS platform. Docker Slim is an open source tool that enables you to minify containers. And you ask, you know, what's the general idea behind it? The general idea is, is that you create your container and then uh, this is a, a bit of a simplification, but you have Docker Slim run that container and it inserts a probe inside that container as it runs and executes and it looks at every asset library executable that was touched and loaded during the execution of that container and when that observation step has been completed docker slim creates a new container that's a single layer container that just includes everything that was used in the execution during that observation step so if it wasn't used wasn't touched wasn't accessed it gets jettisoned and consequently you get a smaller container out the other side so that's a massive oversimplification but <laughs> in simple terms that's how it works now it's i think it's a powerful tool 
but it's certainly got some sort of expert features or expert mm -hmm. knowledge driven features so the power of the slim ai platform is taking that open source tool and then making it more accessible and uh, presenting it to developers in a way that makes it possible for them to iterate on their tasks faster and reducing the friction in exercising a tool with that sort of power and versatility so that sort of um that's sort of the the whole you know uh pitch there about what minification is and what it does and now the benefits are is that you have a smaller uh, container image that you need to move around so your deployment uh, times can be reduced you can be more agile um, the attack surface is significantly reduced as well um, but what's a really useful uh, application of this technology that some people don't see because they some some people think of like um, minification it's a bit like a vanity metric I made my container smaller but the real benefit is this you can have large fat well instrumented containers that you use in your dev environments to iterate and you know code quickly move fast but you can take those same fat containers run them through a minification process and get a production ready container that adheres to best practice out the other side without having to get into multi-stage builds or build packs or maybe moving from your base image of a Debian or Ubuntu or RHEL based OS to an Alpine based image or you know something like that so you can keep all of your existing practices and just tack on the minification at the end of the process so I, I, I imagine that you, that may pose additional questions and that's fine we can answer what we can here but pete's got a, you know an appointment with a with a mountain very soon so <laughs> if you want to ask questions i'll be happy if you drop I'm into our discord channel um uh, you know if you've got questions jump into our discord channel i'll be happy to field any follow-on questions uh in there too and you can find the discord channel uh, from the url above my head yeah i think one thing we did uh, in the Slim platform, which might be interesting. We've been hearing people say it's interesting, um, is we get this question a lot about like what happened during, I ran Docker Slim on my containers. It made a smaller version. Maybe that version worked. Maybe I had to do some, you know, pull some levers, do some flags to, uh, to make it smaller, but like what actually happened. And so on the Slim SAS platform, you know, there's these container diff tools and container visualization tools that can really help you understand exactly what happened um, through that process. And so, you know, those tools on them on their own, you know, like are, are pretty valuable to people who are interested in containers. Um, but specifically for this minification process, it's helpful to understand what happened um, from one container to the next. So. Okay, right. So I'm just I'm just catching up what the, in the chat there. So also, uh, thank you, Aisha for, you know, pitching in. I see Aisha's in the in the chat there as well. It's another one mm -hmm. of our our colleagues um and uh yeah a big pod, big pod has noticed that i'm using uh microsoft edge yes yes microsoft edge for all work related <laughs> things i different browsers for for you know different purposes mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh a malphabeth uh so hopefully i did a half decent job of explaining that sort of um process uh to you and you make the point yeah not needing to think about the premature optimization of size is a good thing yes indeed that's kind of that was the very origins in fact if you go to our youtube channel again you'll find the links above i um had a sort of an interview with uh kyle quest who's the creator of docker slim and our cto to sort of dig into the origins of docker slim and the problems that he was solving for himself through the creation of Docker Slim. So you'll find um, uh, a longer and more um, erudite explanation as to sort of, you know, the motivations as to why Docker Slim came into existence in the first place, if you head over there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And there's so, a question about multi-stage builds, which we can answer it. You know, Docker Slim will work with any kind of OCI compliant uh, image. It, you know, what you get out of it 
in a multi-stage build uh, kind of context, you know, Docker Slim might find some things that aren't being used, but generally those multi-stage build uh, images are, are pretty small in general. So you certainly can do, um, you know, you might ask the question of, should I, you know, and I guess only you can answer that. We have done a few like kind of side-by-side -side comparisons with build packs versus multi-stage builds versus just using Alpine images versus just using kind of container best practices in your Docker file. And, you know, every single thing gets a little more out of it, but, you know, for the examples that we've seen so far, Docker Slim tends to perform really, really well, if not the best out of, out of those options. So, um, you know, there are multiple techniques you can use to do this and, you know, you should use the things that, that make the most sense for you, but, um, you know, you can run Docker Slim on multi-stage builds, but, you know, if you're making a multi-stage build, it may or may not make sense for your workflow. So. And the, the other thing I'd say is if you are, are at a point where you're thinking about introducing multi-stage builds into your pipeline in order to address some of these problems, then maybe take a look at Docker Slim because it may mean that you don't have to get into multi-stage builds because Docker Slim will do that heavy lift for you. Hmm. Oh. Hi, Danny's joined us and she says, uh, they say... Uh... Erudite is a word I only know the meaning of through Divergence, a teen dystopic book. So I think, uh, yeah, Danny, I would definitely take your recommendations on dystopic teen literature anytime. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think where we are then is um, tomorrow I'm going to try and figure out why that network labeling that, that we assumed would work didn't work big pod is suggesting that may be a dns problem but of course it is because aren't mm -hmm. all network problems dns problems at the end of the day yeah. so uh maybe I'll, big pod say when can... we were working on it i i really felt like a real developer because i was like i bet the problem is dns <laughs> and i really want to just tweet the problem is dns right now like that's what developers do so well whilst that you're happens. whilst you're you know sipping hot chocolate and skiing down a mountain tomorrow and keep keep one eye on your twitter feed because if it is a dns problem i will let you know <laughs> all right sounds good sounds good Perfect. but maybe big pod you can join me in our discord channel for maybe 30 40 minutes tomorrow and we can just dig into that particular issue and for any of you that are here that would like to join that and like take a look at what we discover again that our discord um is uh links in the url above my head um hop in there join we'll announce when our office hours start it's usually uh 10 a.m uh eastern uh time in the us and that's about 3 p.m in the uk 4 p.m in uh, central europe so you know if you're around that time you want to hop in for you know 30 40 minutes and uh either learn something or help teach us something uh both works for us so we don't we don't care uh which way the communication goes <clears throat> then uh you know you're more than welcome to join yes and yeah next week we'll actually be joined by uh kit merker <clears throat> who i don't think we've had on this stream before but has been on a few uh slim ai interviews so kit is yep. the coo of noble nine which is an observability tool based around service level objectives slows he'll tell you all about it he's also on our advisory board and just kind of a great great character in the space. He was kind of behind the original KubeCon and he was had worked on Kubernetes early in early days. So um, excited to have him on. And I think we'll have some some good stuff to talk about uh, next week. And then week after that, I think we'll get back to uh, building out this app and setting up the database, which should be super fun. I'm really excited to uh, to kind of get it up and running with everything yeah. worked out. So. Yeah, and uh, we were talking about minification earlier. Where we're heading with all of this is once we have our app where the Docker Compose that defines the front end, the back end, and the database server container, we're then going to get in, into how do you minify that Docker Compose, all of it treated as a logical whole so we've now you know defined our infrastructure but now we want to minify all of those constituent parts and we will demonstrate some of the new features of the slim SaaS platform in order to do do all of that so that's where we're headed with this <clears throat> yeah should be fun so 
Right. <clears throat> so Danny says they do make use of multi-stage builds for the very reasons that we were describing earlier, that you could use Docker Slim to, you know, uh, minimize the size and uh, reduce the number of layers in an image. And Big Pod, I know uh, you've not been on top form. So if I'm volunteering you for something tomorrow that you're not up for doing, just let me know and you can you can rest up. I'll uh, I'll I'll muddle through and uh, and get it done. But if you are able to join, even if it's just on the keyboard, uh, I'd certainly uh, appreciate your experience. <laughs> Right. OK, so uh, we've got some friends who were streaming earlier. Oh, they have finished. OK. And so have they. Oh, dear. OK, so let's see now. We've got one of our friends is still streaming. So let's uh, let's do this. Let's uh, go and raid one of our friends who's doing a dev stream at the moment. They're doing uh, Flutter live coding. Uh, so let's let's head over there. So um, we're going to head over and join our friend Yannick. Thank you all very much for stopping by. Um, we'll be back same time next week uh, with uh, Kit. Uh, but until then, um, uh, come and join our Discord and ask questions and teach us stuff. Right. right. Thanks, everyone. Well, thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye for now.